Hello, and welcome to our Art and Architecture webinar series. I'm Kurt D. Camello, the Curator of Fine Art and American Ancestors. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical society in the world. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end. I'd also like to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to yours with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and thank you for your patience. Even if we do lose connection, you will have access to a full recording on our website that you can watch at any time. Fifteen years after having abdicated the throne to marry the woman he loved, King Edward VIII, now the Duke of Windsor, published his memoirs. But while preparing the manuscript for his published and mostly ghost-written book, the Duke also produced a private manuscript for posterity. Written in his own words with an uninhibited frankness, this manuscript included much that the former king could not write for publication in 1951. In today's presentation, Jane Tippett will weave together Edward's writing, newly uncovered interviews with the Duke and Duchess, diary entries from ghostwriter Charles Murphy, and other sources to form an extraordinary new portrait of one of the most famous characters in modern royal history. I would also like to thank the Joseph and Robert Cornell Memorial Foundation for their very generous sponsorship of the Art and Architecture webinar series. Jane Marguerite Tippett grew up outside Philadelphia and studied at the universities of Delaware and Oxford. She has worked as a consultant, archivist, and fine art curator in New York, London, and Paris. Jane lives between London and New York with her husband, Martin, who's English, by the way. Please join me in welcoming Jane. Thank you so much, Kurt, for the really kind introduction. It's a delight to be here with you this afternoon, talking in a quite shameless promotional way about my recently published book, Once a King, The Lost Memoir of Edward VIII. I think it's important before jumping into our topic that I'd be very upfront and acknowledge that this was so not the book I thought I was going to write. Instead, when I began my work on Edward VIII in around 2021, I thought that I was embarking on what was to be an in-depth examination of the personal and political consequences of the 13 crucial months in the life of Edward VIII that followed his abdication in 1936. And this year encompassed not only his marriage to Wallace Simpson, for whom he had abdicated the throne, but his 14-day trip to Germany, during which time he met briefly with Adolf Hitler. Both events were seminal in shaping the remainder of his life, but I think more importantly, and for me, uh, his legacy as a member of the British royal family and where he fit into the history of 20th century British monarchy. And so from the outset of that project, I had really relied heavily on the Windsor's two respective autobiographies, A King's Story, which was published in 1951, and Wallace's A Heart Has Its Reasons, which appeared in 1956. Though Edward's memoir had stopped in 1936, Wallace's had tackled head on the years after the abdication. And I really considered both of the, these texts to be key sources. I mean, despite the inevitable limitations and subjectivity that all memoirs entail, they really were the only lengthy public pronouncements the Windsors ever made about their lives. But in the early stages of my research, I had been content not to penetrate beyond these published editions, both of which I knew had been prepared with the assistance of Charles J.B. Murphy, a prominent American journalist and longstanding correspondent for Life magazine. It was not until in the midst of my research, secondary research, I'll admit, that I came across a source note in, in a 2018 biography of the Duchess by Andrew Morton, and I began to think more seriously about the ghostwriter and, in particular, Murphy's role in the couple's lives. So Morton, in his book, had boasted of uncovering, as he called it, the biographical equivalent of the Aladdin's cave in finding the uncatalogued archive of Cleveland Amory, which happens to be in Boston, who for four months in 1955 had briefly replaced Murphy as Wallace's collaborator. 
And the reference, what it did was, apart from wanting to go and see what was in Amory's papers themselves, it opened up my the idea of to the possibility of what Murphy's papers might hold, um, of course, if they even existed. Thanks to the wonders of Google, it took only minutes to discover that they did, in fact, exist. And they were publicly accessible at the Howard Gottlieb Research Center, also in Boston, at Boston University. Um, so I eagerly, of course, you know, shot off an email to the archivist and um, got back quite quickly um, the catalog. And it was a large collection. It consisted of about 17 boxes, eight of which um, were entirely de devoted to the Windsors. There were about 300 individual files in those boxes. Um, and when I visited them for the first time in June 2022, which is really the start of, of this book, Once a King, I was really astounded to learn from the librarian that they had basically been unconsulted since they had arrived there in the mid-1990s. Um, and I think um, before jumping into what I found in the Murphy archive, I think it's important just to pause and say, you know, this was the sort of experience that all historians dream of. I mean, this, what I encountered in the Murphy papers is it, it, it's, it's, it's what we all wish to do, which is basically find, uncover a cache of unpublished fresh material about our subjects. And I can only say that, you know, the two days I spent in Boston in, in June 22, I mean, it was unforgettable. You know, I found myself in the first day reading through what was this exhaustive record of the Murphy's relationship with the Windsors, which had spanned, as I, as I came to understand, when he first met them in 1946, until really the Duke's death. Um, but with the core concentration being between 1947 and 1956, when he was actually working on these memoirs. And, and it was almost a sort of um, a, a compulsive need to basically just zip through the files because it was like finding one treasure trove after the other. I mean, what jumped out immediately were these um, unedited first drafts of a King's story, but alongside them were hundreds of Murphy's own notes, um, which were records of conversations with Edward Wallace and the many other people that he spoke with in their circle um, during both books. Murphy was also a voracious letter writer and the collection contained his correspondence from the period. Um, and he was, he at times could write anywhere from five to 10 letters a day. And the letters were just quite incredible in their sort of precise, almost granular detail of um, his observations and what was happening with the Windsors. Um, the, the material also included quite tantalizingly about 200 pages of transcripts from the interviews he conducted with Wallace and Edward, which were made in the fall of 1954. And these were to prepare Wallace's autobiography. As I would learn later, she was not a writer. Um, Murphy's methodology was to interview the Windsors and to then uh, use that content to draft text. Um, and, and he really spoke with both of them to, to create that material. But as, you know, perhaps even it, one of the more sort of, um, I think, moving or sort of, you know, intimate areas of the archive were his diaries, which he kept, um, through again, throughout this period of working with them. And, and these diaries shift between um, during the early years when he's working on the Duke's memoir to these kind of long narrative uh, observations of the Windsors to then, while he's working with Wallace, a far more sort of um, detailed, you know, this is what daily life was with the Duke and Duchess. Um, I've included in this slide, you know, a few examples from the archive. I mean, in this diary entry in particular, so this is one of, um, this is this dated May, 1948. Um, it's when they were actually in Locust Valley, he was working with the Duke. And um, this is just kind of a summation of these observations he's collected. And, and this entry starts out um, about Edward and saying, up with the larks at nine o'clock, his clothes beautiful, pink with blue plaid, beautifully pressed. Then at the very end, he shifts his gaze to the Duchess and he writes, the Duchess said, sometimes it seems almost too much. Why should we waste our energy trying to keep up this show and protect all these lovely things? Sometimes I think the happiest thing we could do would be to get a little apartment in New York and forget it all. And with a smile, she turned to me and said, 
that mood doesn't last for long. So these are really just kind of these wonderful, intimate, really kind of unguarded um, uh, sort of observations that Murphy is recording. Um, so, you know, again, in these first two days, it was just this kind of fast paced drive through the material, but it was impossible occasionally not to be really struck by a particular document. Um, and in the case, this this is a, an example of one of those of, of one of those documents. So these are um, two very small. They're they're just little memo paper um, sheets from the Waldorf Astoria, which is where the, the Windsors would always stay when they were in New York. And Murphy had clipped it to another page and then labeled it, type, typed up, labeled HRH's description of the Duchess. And this is, and I knew immediately this was Edward's own hand. This was Edward's hand. And I thought, this is amazing. This is the uh, a man who had abdicated his throne, one of the great stories of uh, the 20th century to marry this very controversial woman. And here he is sitting down with his ghostwriter in his New York hotel, writing out what he thinks are her defining qualities. I mean, this was just kind of one of those wow moments of the experience. Um, but I'd say in general, the overall effect of the two days was realizing that I was no longer writing about 1937, um, that these papers um, opened up a new story about the Windsors. Um, it took me a little while to come to grips with what that story was, but um, I, I, had an, I, had a, I had a new book to write. And what happened over the next kind of few months really was a, a research journey. Um, and part of that research journey was um, a newfound appreciation for the role of Life magazine in the genesis of Edward's memoir. Um, so Edward had um, been contracted by Henry Luce to write a series of articles published first in 1947 and then in May 1950 about his life. Now, Luce, who was the founder of Time Inc., had done the initial um, outreach, but it was in fact the chairman of the Board of Editors of Life, Daniel Longwell, who had really taken over Edward's story and shepherded him through to the completion. And so obviously, my next stop was Columbia University, where Longwell's archive was deposited um, after his death. Um, and, you know, this archive didn't have any of the drafts or interviews, but what it did have was it told with even greater precision than Murphy's had the kind of diplomatic tightrope that the men at Time Inc. had really walked, you know, not only to secure Edward's, Edward's memoir in the first place, but really to sustain his momentum over the more than four years he spent working on these articles. And, um, you know, Longwell becomes a sort of chief, the chief diplomat, you know, Edward wavered at various points, anxiety about the royal family's reaction, which I'll talk about a little bit later, often made him rethink momentarily what he was doing. And Longwell always steps in um, and gives him some assurance. He, he later described his role um, uh, to a Time Inc. Uh, a, a researcher who was put, putting together a history of the, of the company. And he described his role in the Edwards memoir as, quote, I was the hand holder, the slave driver, the mean guy, the patcher up of quarrels, and the entertainer. So I eventually found myself, um, made it across the pond um, to other archives. The first was the parliamentary archives to the papers of William Maxwell Aitken, the first Baron Beaverbrook, or as Murphy dubbed him, the Beaver. Uh, he was a really influential individual in the abdication. He'd been an extremely supportive ally of Edward. He had, in fact, argued that Edward should use the power of his media empire in Britain and try to put his case for marriage to Wallace to the people and sort of shore up popular support. Edward does not do that. But he's grateful for Beaver Book's support, and the two remain friends even after um, in, in his exile. And Beaverbrook was one of the first people that Edward actually said, talked about the memoir process with and, and said that he was planning to do this. Um, and he also becomes one of his first readers. And in the end of um, the summer of 1949, having finished um, the first drafts of his chapters on the abdication, he sends them to Beaverbrook for his, his 
sort of his read. Um, and and they were sitting there in in his archives, a very well mined archive used by many historians, but who had just overlooked the importance of these drafts. And finally, of course, I made my way to the Royal Archives. Um, and this is, I really describe this as kind of the second eureka moment of the project. Um, so when I when I went to the Royal Archives, the, the way it works is you typically will ask what you would like to see, you know, what's what's your field of interest and, and what do you wish to 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 look at while you're there? And and I said that I was interested in looking at anything related to you with Edward's writing. And so they they brought out on a trolley a series of big red boxes. Um, and the first one was it contained probably two to 300 loose sheets of yellow legal note paper, um, written, pencil written. It was Edward's hand. I knew that right away. And these I discovered were his drafts of his memoir. And the reason I say it was a eureka moment is because I had seen a lot of type drafts previously in Murphy's papers, Beaver Brooks. And I had assumed that they had in fact been Murphy's first, um, first attempts at ghostwriting. What I realized was that in fact, they were the typed up versions of what Edward himself has written. And you'll notice on the screen that they're on the, on the page that it has a red cross on it. So that would have denoted that Edward would having finished that page, have written all he wanted to for that page, he would have passed it on to his secretary who would have then typed it up. So Murphy could review it, edit it, um, you know, clean up the wording. And, and Edward was extremely precise in how he would write. So you'll also notice at the top left, he's dated it July 5th. And so all of the type drafts, they, they, are, they are separated by date. And so you can see exactly Edward's pace of work, you know, and sometimes he would write just a couple of paragraphs. Other days, it would be page after page. So you, one got as one took away a sense of his his output, how he worked as a writer, but it but most importantly, that he was a writer, and that really changed the scope of the project because it gave an agency and an importance to these drafts that while they would have always been interesting as just sort of you know the first go round of a memoir, they they were given a sort of new centrality as the first. Well, as, as, as the colleague of mine has referred to it, the first drafts of history, Edward's first draft of history. Um, but I think it's also at the stage a little, it's important to sort of give some recognition or recognize a little bit about who Charles Murphy was um, and, and how he factors into the story. So Murphy in so many ways is, is a really unlikely pairing for Edward. Um, he was born in 1904 outside Boston to Irish Canadian parents, not wealthy at all, um, but he was, an he was intelligent. He went to Harvard, though he, but he dropped out in 1924 because he was offered a job as a rewrite man at Associated Press, and, and his dream was to be a journalist. And he really spent the next decade um, climbing the ladder of American journalism. And eventually, he caught on to the story of the American admiral and explorer Richard Byrd. And Byrd immediately appreciated Murphy's skills as a storyteller and commissioned him to write a series of autobiog autobiographical books about his adventures. So this was Murphy's first ghostwriting job. But the two, as was, I think, the habit of Murphy, um, he became friends with his subjects and and Bur he and Bird became close friends. Bird was actually his um, his best man at his wedding. And Murphy eventually joins him on his second Antarctic expedition, which begins in 1933. And he's writing birds broadcasts from their base, Little America, which went out over CBS. And so this image is of um, Murphy and Bird broadcasting from Little America. Um, and then um, on the on the right, we have them on their return um, again with that that CBS monitor. Um, his return to after the 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 mission with Bird is a return to is actually a, the beginning, not a return, but the beginning of his career with Time Inc. Uh, he joins Fortune magazine, but eventually starts writing for Life and and Time. And he spends the war in Europe. 
Um, and he's primarily writing for life where his sort of narrative flair, I think was particularly effective with these kind of dramatic wartime features that he undertook and what, which included a kind of rivet of an extremely riveting article on the sinking of the Zamzam in 1941 and on which he was actually a passenger. But it was Murphy's two-part feature on the life of Winston Churchill that precipitated his first meeting with Edward. Um, this article, Edward had just arrived back in New York. He had left um, his after giving up his posting as Governor General of the Bahamas. And this article caught his eye. Um, he liked, I think it was again Murphy's style that he mm -hmm. liked, um, drawn to Murphy's ability to write a historic but humanizing story. Um, and I think Edward immediately twigged on to the idea of that the way in which Murphy might be able to apply his flair to Edward's story but Edward's story for a particularly American audience. Um, and the two men were actually connected by Edward's American lawyer, Hank Walter, who knew Murphy so socially. And they met over lunch at the Waldorf in May, 1945, and, and sort of tentatively discussed what the idea of a memoir ghostwritten by Murphy might be. I think it's also probably helpful to give it some to give at this point some context context around where the Duke of Windsor was in 1945. You know, he was coming off six years of a really continuous employment, albeit employment in exile. Um, he'd spent the war years first as a serving officer to the British military mission in France, and then as Governor General of the Bahamas from August 1940 to May 1945. And when he meets Murphy, he was headed back to exile in France and for the time being, unemployment. And he was anxious for purpose and anxious for something to do. But I think one of the reasons the memoir, the discussion didn't really move and beyond just a discussion in May 1945 was because Edward really hoped for a position from the British government. And he spent about, spent about more than a year lobbying his brother um, for a diplomatic posting to the United States um, and eventually is, is told that, that that is not going to happen. And when that comes in April 1946, he, he writes rather defiantly back to his brother and he says to him definitively that I must, quote, look for a job in whatever sphere and country I can find one suitable to my qualification. So obviously the memoir returned to his mind and, and he starts writing about it or thinking about it with a few select advisors in the spring of 1946, but it's uh, it's when he comes back to New York in November that he and Murphy began talking again. In fact, he meets with Murphy the very the day after he arrives in New York. So I, I think that seems that shows that he was he was he was definitely interested. You know, I think part of that was because in contrast to the really, you know, obviously the tepid reception he'd received at Buckingham Palace, Murphy, Longwell, and, and the men of life were, were exhilarated by the prospect of sponsoring Edward's memoir. I mean, this was a journalistic coup to get the ex-King of England to write for Life magazine. And so they are all enthusiastic and, and overwhelming Edward with attention, um, which I think he liked and liked, and, and it appealed to appealed to him when he was very much looking for something to do. And so in this in the late summer of in the early summer of 1947, he agrees to allow Murphy to come to his home on the Cap d'Antibes, La Croix, and they begin the process of drafting three articles that will appear in Life magazine in December of 1947. Now, the scope of those articles was carefully thought out from the beginning. Henry Luce is the one who really takes control of that dialogue, and, and he makes sure that Edward knows that, you know, this is not going to stray to the political edge. This is going to be, as he calls it, quote, a charming story. It's he's, He writes at one point and says it will be, quote, your own account of your boyhood in England, in brief, the career and upbringing of the Prince of Wales. So they decided quickly that the articles would stop at the end of the uh, First World War, um, that they would be his childhood, his memories growing up, um, you know, and, and, and it would just, it would be, it would be a gentle piece. And this really is because Edward is feeling the ground or feeling the water, testing the waters of what a memoir would entail. 
Um, and, and that's in part because from the outset, he's really conscious of, of how controversial this is and the kind of reaction that it's going to bring from his family. Um, and, and Murphy, when he goes down to LaCroix, is faced with all of this, not only Edward's hesitancy, his caution, anxiety, but the fact that he basically, as he writes, needs to learn the habits of work. Um, he, you know, Murphy immediately sort of rushes off a letter to Daniel Longwell and says, you know, he just doesn't know how to organize his ideas. He doesn't know how to reminisce. He's, Murphy says at one point, I don't think he has ever reminisced. Um, and so all of this um, becomes part of the brief. And he, he writes actually at one point to um, Alan Grover, who was the vice president of Time Inc. And, and he describes this inability and he, he says of Edward, quote, he moved in events without ever being part of them. He made me think of a stone in a lively brook. Then I began to understand what it was that was lacking. It was the element of struggle. There was no risk in his life. Now, obviously, Murphy is patient, and he works to help, works with Edward to help overcome these. And, and what I have on the screen here is a is a piece of um, it's it's one of these sort of uh, interview interview notes that Murphy kept, and he's labeled at H R H Lacroix, nineteen forty seven. And I, I I doubt it's the very start of their work together, but it certainly offers, I think, a, a good entry point. And and in this, Edward describes himself and what he's doing as um, this, that it's the story of a simple, the simple story of a man who was raised to be king. And, and it will be the story of his life, but as he calls it, his career. So it's also important to note at this point regarding the book that this is not a biography. Um, you know, there are whole areas of Edward's life that we don't, that I do not cover. And that's partly because um, a lot of what he wrote actually did make it into a King story and into the life articles. And what I've tried to do in this book is take take only the material that doesn't make it into this into his published editions. And one of the areas that is heavily cut is um, his writings on the First World War. Um, and I think we can, yes, move to the next slide. Um, so Edward was uh, stationed in Europe from 1914 until 1919 when he comes back to Britain. And he writes at length about his experiences, particularly in France. The only other area of his life that he wrote as much about in this project was in fact the abdication. And these drafts are his uh, unvarnished um, account of really the horror of war that he sees. He's not an, he's not act, he's not in the trenches. He wasn't an, he wasn't an active combat, uh, that was prevented. He was prevented from doing that for, mostly on a fear that he would be, um, captured, um, and, and held prisoner rather than that he would be killed. He obviously had several other brothers, but these are extremely moving accounts of what he saw, I think. And, and really, um, are a testament to the fact that the First World War was the formative experience of his young adulthood. It instills in him the belief that there could be no political conflict worthy of the sort of human slaughter that he has, that he witnesses. And it's, you know, I think it, it can't be underemphasized enough in terms of thinking about who Edward becomes and the political views he adopts in the mid 1930s as war starts to loom in Europe. Um, but all the while along, you know, all the while along this as Edward's writing, there are looming figures in his mind. And, and, and I, and that really is the Royal family, Edward and Murphy, finish the articles, at least in Edward's view, quite quickly, Murphy's view, not so quickly. Um, they, they get drafts done by sort of early October, 1947. And at that stage of the writing being over, the emphasis for Edward now shifts to his family. Throughout the, both in these, the first set of articles and the second set, Edward did not sign a contract with Life Magazine until almost publication was imminent. And that was because he reserved the right to change his mind and life because the story was so good. They were willing to take the risk and simply just hope that the money they were pouring into this project came of something. Obviously, in both cases, he does sign the contracts. They are published. But the thing that's really holding him back, I think, at all times 
is the idea of what his brother will think, but I think more importantly, actually what his mother will think um, and, and how critical they will be of the project. Um, and at one point, uh, Murphy describes this, you know, this basically almost overarching anxiety to Longwell. And he says that it's, it's, it's with us daily, but so too is the pull of Edward's belief that he'd like to be remembered as something more than a man who was not allowed to remain king of England. So he's constantly battling these two, these two sort of competing impulses, his fear about his family's views, and then, um, and but what he wants to do as far as his legacy. And, and really, as soon as the articles start coming out in the US, um, they were actually couriered um, to the offices of both George VI and, and Queen Mary, um, but especially by the, the Time Bureau chief in London, Walter Gravener, they are anxious to find any little tidbits of gossip about what the family think think has happened. Uh, Walter Gravener at one point claim one point claims that um, he's heard that the king and queen felt it was quote in bad taste for Windsor to write the articles, and that Queen Mary is annoyed and worried. A friend of Murphy's, uh, Raymond von Hofmannsthal, um, who was a, a Time correspondent in London encountered the king and queen at a reception in St. James's Palace in mid-December 1947. So two of, so one of the articles is out and um, he's actually really accosted by George VI, who is uh, voraciously trying to pump him for details on how the writing took place and how much did his brother really do of the articles. Um, and then finally they get to money and George VI would really like to know how much he got paid. And the conversation sort of ends by George VI saying to Hoffman Stahl, well, he certainly doesn't need the money. You know, he's immensely rich. Um, so I think that's a that's a good indication probably of, of, of where the royal thinking was at that point. Um, but the, the obviously sort of negative views of his family don't stop Edward with continuing on um, with Murphy. Almost as soon as the 1947 articles are out, the men of life, Longwell in particular, continue courting Edward. Um, and, and they're courting him really because they want to tell the story of 1936. That's the story Murphy at one point calls, quote, the journalistic homestake. Um, but they're, they're, they're soft in their approach. Uh, Murphy describes it as we, one time, at one point to Longwell, we must be light and deft uh, in how we deal with Edward. And again, part of that was by not insisting on a contract, um, sending Murphy to wherever Edward was, and just basically giving him free reign of Murphy to work with him. So they start out in 1948 on this next set of articles, they start out in Palm Beach. Um, and this particular draft is actually a dictation, which which was a particularly in the early in the early part of their collaboration was something they did often. And it deals with Edward's trip in 1921 to India. Um, and it's it's a fascinating eight pages of description of, of what that tour was like. And they're in Palm Beach until really sort of the first week of April. And um, Murphy in tow with Edward and Wallace head up to uh, New York. Um, and to Locust Valley, the Windsors rented a home um, uh, in Locust Valley on 11 Horse Valley Road. Um, in fact, this photograph was actually taken on April 12th. Um, they posed for photographers outside this rented home. And Murphy, he, Murphy stayed with the Windsors there until they went back to France um, in June. And, and they, they re their pace at this point is, um, is startlingly quick. Um, there's a huge amount of drafts that date from sort of the first week of April through to the end of May. I've I've shown I'm showing one example here, and that's that's a I think this is about 21 pages of a uh, description of his trip to South America in 1931. Um, it was a trip that he made with his brother, the future Duke of Kent. It was a trade. It was a trade mission. It was designed to bolster trade between Britain and. Um, and South America. Uh, and it was, this was actually a subject that Edward wrote it again about. And he would often do that, you know, he didn't tackle it once. He would, sometimes he could tackle it two to three times, depending, I think, on the level of interest or 
or or even you know he would also bring in at times uh, former aides and and friends who had experienced some of these uh, these moments with him, and they would revisit a subject. and And the South America trip certainly certainly is one of those examples. But having tired of New York, as one does, one heads, of course, to the Cap d'Antibes, um, and they, ret they return to um, La Croix, um, Murphy again in tow. Um, they, they go back in June 1948, and La Croix really becomes where they do the bulk of the memoir writing. This was the Windsor's principal home in, um, in France. They... Um, they gave up their, they give at some point, at one point during this memoir writing, they give up in 1948, they give up their Paris home. So La Croix really becomes their base. And Murphy is stationed there. Um, and get, understanding, I think, that now the longevity of what's going to happen here, he insists that his family um, join him. Now, this is that, these are actually, this is in the first page of an album and and of, a, of, of the first summer they spend in the Cap d'Antibes, the Murphy family, put together by Murphy's daughter, Edith. Um, and it's just, I think, a charming sort of, uh, captures in a charming way, uh, the Murphy's family life on the Cap, Cap d'Antibes, which really became entwined with Edward and Wallace's. Le Clocher, the villa they rented, was just about a five-minute walk from La Croix, and the Murphy children were in and out of the Windsor's home on a daily basis, um, and they really formed this, particularly with Edward, a, a quite sweet relationship. His his daughter, Edith, who is, has wonderful memories of Windsor, as she calls him, as a little girl uh, walking along the kind of rocky coastline um, of the Cap d'Antibes, learning to play archery, a very different portrait of Edward than I think we're, we're used to hearing about. Um, but also amongst this group was uh, Murphy's uh, researcher and secretary, Monica Wyatt, who also lived with them at Le Clocher. And she was she was with Murphy and Edward, again, on, on a at almost every one of their meetings, and and she provide at one point she she sends she writes a very wonderful I think description of kind of the routine that develops at Cap Antibes. He dines with the Windsors, he being Murphy, at least four nights a week. Plays golf with the Duke every afternoon. Writes himself all morning until two thirty p.m. and then from six to eight thirty each evening is spent with the Duke going over what's been done. The Duke is so pleased with the chapters that when we go there for dinner, he can hardly wait for the meal to be over so that he can read aloud the latest pages. I'm not so sure the Duchess is quite so keen to live with the work 24 hours a day, but the Duke is thriving on it. He told me that he didn't have time to read a story in Harper's because, he said, a man as busy as I am just doesn't have something, have time for something like that. So I think that's kind of a wonderful picture of really what sort of went on in this really intimate exchange between these two men. And I think it's partly the intimacy that's forged with Murphy that um, really gives Edward the confidence to decide on what his project will be. And in the in August 1948, he writes to Longwell and said that he's so interested in what he's doing, he's so engaged with it, he is now going to write a full and unexpurgated book in which he will, quote, omit nothing, however secret and personal. And this is really what he starts to do. His advisor in England, Walter Monckton, describes it as his gift to eventual, his contribution to eventual historians. And um, he starts creating content that he has absolutely no intention of publishing. Now, he, the unfortunately, the imp publishing imperatives of Time, Inc. rather um, halt that process, and he doesn't finish the unexpurgated book. But his drafts that he produces over, the, over 1948 and 1949 are part of that project and are thus give us a, a really unique insight into what Edward thought, how Edward thought about his life, both personal and public. Well, what were really the topics that he covered? I mean, first and foremost was his time as Prince of Wales. And this really focuses on his tours um, that he undertakes between 1919 and 1925, his tours across the empire that were designed to really stabilize and solidify support for the British monarchy in, it, in its imperial outposts. This selection of images I've taken from a, it's a quite close reading of the tours are from 1919 when he visited Canada and then made a sort of two week stop to the United States. 
this was such an important tour for Edward. It really establishes him as a kind of international celebrity. He's given this ticker tape parade in New York. He he falls in, it's at this point that he falls in love with America. You know, he writes of the ticker tape parade, seeing the crowds. And he says, you know, it went to his head like champagne. He loved Americans. He loved American culture. He says that he left the U.S. a changed man. He, and another passage, he writes, the United States took my breath away. I felt its movement and power, its boldness and greatness. And more than that, I liked it all. And this 1919 tour is really the start of a love affair with America. Um, and I think it's actually quite important in understanding Edward, not just in the abdication, in his ability to sort of think of the abdication of a uniquely American concept, the idea that a king gives up a throne for love. This is almost Hollywood. This is Hollywood glamour. But also the his belief that Americans understood him. And that's quite important when it comes to write his memoir, because he looks to America, to an American journalist to write, um, to write his, to help write his autobiography. I've included this other image just for the fun of it, just to show you what a celebrity Edward truly was. This was a piece from Vanity Fair illustrating a series of, quote, impossible interviews. And this is uh, uh, Edward handing over the mantle of his preeminent celebrity to Clark Gable, seeding, seeding the landscape. But his time as Prince of Wales but more importantly, what he took from his role as Prince of Wales becomes a really important part of his memoir. He outlines in, in these pages what he, how he believed he de redefined the role of Prince of Wales the, and, and how he believed it was his duty to reshape that office for a 20th century public. He, he wrote that he believed the, the, the monarchy needed to, quote, democratize and bring itself nearer to the people. Um, he goes about his job with an informal, almost meritocratic approach. He, he gets rid of the top hat. Um, he goes around in a suit and bowler hat. This drove his father, George V, crazy. He thought it was completely unbecoming of a Prince of Wales. And I've included just a short quotation from a longer interview that Murphy recorded. And this was toward the end of uh, their work together in, in the spring of um, the fall of 1950. And Edward writes of his time as Prince of Wales, I believe in all truth that I brought the monarchy closer to the people, but in the process of doing so, I gradually lost faith in the in myself in the institution. Quite a powerful, quite something, quite a powerful statement, I think, from the from a, a royal about what monarchy actually means. He also, though, touches, of course, on his family life. These again were very much to be drafts that were held in private. He writes at length about his parents, about the atmosphere of, of being with his in his parents' home, the rigidity of their lives. You know, he notes uh, rather ironically that the biographers always know the simplicity of their life, but says the only simplistic thing was that decorum never changed. And, and, and I think you get a sense of, from these pages of, of his sense of isolation from the rest of his family, his sense, his sense of estrangement from the, the, the culture in a sense that he was brought, on, brought up on, partly, I think, as a result of the extended absences from Britain when he was doing those tours between 1919 and 1925. A subject he speaks about with great length is and great love is his home, Fort Belvedere. Um, this was a grace, this is a grace and favor house in Windsor Great Park. Um, it was built around 1746 by Prince William Augustus, the Duke of Cumberland, a third son of George II. And it was his Edward's home from 1929 onwards and well, until the abdication. Mm -hmm. And he wrote of the fort that it was there, quote, that life began to mean something to me. He said in another conversation with Murphy, quote, when I left, I when I left, I thought how wonderful if I could only pick it up, stuff it in a bag and take it with me. And of course, it's at the fort that the drama of the that the drama of the abdication takes place. And uh, Walter Monkton later described it as a fabulous setting. Um, for such a crisis. And of course, he inevitably must tackle Wallace Simpson. Um, he does so in his written drafts very, um, 
very tentatively. And it's only really after building the rapport with Murphy that he's able to open up and talk about the way in which Wallace brought something to his life that he had never had before. Um, you know, he describes her, um, her curiosity, her independence, her impudence, her questioning and her warmth. He also writes at length about his views on marriage and, and his unwillingness to um, accede to a marriage of convenience. And of course, kingship is central to the project of this memoir. He writes again at length about his views on what a modern king should bring. He, he, he says at one point, it, he felt it his obligation to bring to the task of kingship a fresh and original mind. And part of that originality was to be his right to a private life, which he believed he should have um, the ability to hold on to. One of the important events of his reign is the Nolan cruise, and he does write about that at length, both about his experiences of basically being a celebrity on view at every moment um, during the cruise, but also of the encounters he had with the great Balkan monarchs and political figures. He meets Ataturk on this voyage. He sees King George II of Greece, and he writes at great length about his experiences um, on this, at, at times, semi-diplomatic trip. But of course, the main um, thrust of this book was to be the abdication. And it's the abdication that Murphy in, 19, in the summer of 1949 is really working with Edward to, to create. This is a wonderful image of Murphy at work at Le Clocher in July 1949 at the, at the really at the heart of when he and Edward were drafting um, these chapters. And these chapters are, I think, you know, not, not always factually foolproof. They are certainly Edward's memory of the events that happened, but they are his frank firsthand account of this seismic event in his life, the event that changes everything, which of course is the abdication. And I think one of, you know, I think there are two real things you, one draws from this material from Edward. And Firstly, is the real struggle he felt to find a solution that would not only secure his marriage, but also keep his throne. He wanted to have both. He he did not want to, he did not wish to give up one or the other. And one of the sort of profound, another takeaway, profound takeaways from this is the role of Wallace Simpson in all of this, which was basically a non-existent role. And this comes out both in Edward's writing, but I think more acutely when Murphy returns to the Windsors in 1954 and starts working on Wallace's memoir. And again, as I mentioned, you know, Wallace didn't write her memoir. This certainly, this was very much a ghostwritten project. And she spoke to Murphy and Murphy drafted text. And what you get, this is a Wallace's account of the abdication, which was done, written on, uh, she, she told him on October 28th, 1954, while they were in Paris, you get this sense that Wallace was very much an observer. She was not a participant. She did not make the decisions. The abdication, I think, came to her as it was a profound shock, and, and it was left to her to simply readjust her life to the future that Edward had chosen for them. And finally, I'll, I'll end this part of the presentation with sort of the final research moment. And um, so throughout the project, I had dreamed of seeing, of course, Edward and Murphy together. Um, and I, I spoke to his family and, you know, they didn't think a picture existed. And this was on one of my last visits. I mean, literally last visits. The manuscript was almost ready to go off. And um, it was to the um, New York Historical Society. And there it was uh, in sort of almost, I think, the final folder I looked at in, 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 the, in the paper. Papers I had retrieved, and, and it was Edward uh, and Murphy together at Edward's suite at the Waldorf Towers talking about the articles for NBC um, in May 1950. So this was a very, very special way to sort of end the to end the journey of, of this book once again. Wow, Jane, thank you so much for that incredible and fascinating presentation. Before we get to your questions, we have some upcoming programs that I would like to mention. First, the wonderful, excuse me, Christopher Ridgway on April 19th will be giving a lecture called Heridans and Heroines, the Women of Castle Howard. Then on May 16th, I will be hosting Nathaniel Taylor for a discussion called Heraldic Decorative Arts in Colonial and Revolutionary America. Then I'll be giving a lecture on May 28th called The Cock and Lion, French Design in British Historic Houses. And then finally, we want you all to come to Boston because 
let's be honest, Boston is the center of the universe. And that is where I'll be giving a lecture that I haven't even finished writing yet called From Plinth to Penn, How the English Country House Inspired the Writings of Jane Austen, which will include afternoon tea. Now, let's get to your questions. Go ahead and type your query into the question panel at the bottom, and we will answer as many as we can in the time we have. So I'm going to start off, um, Miss Jane, by asking you, do you think um, that Edward would have been a great king if he'd reigned longer? I think that it would have been a very different style of kingship than the kind of monarchy that emerged with George VI and Elizabeth, um, Queen Elizabeth. They tailored their 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 identity around domesticity, around the queen's sort of comforting regal glamour, and that very much worked. Of course, that was the model um, established by George V. And, and Edward presents, from the start, a very unconventional image. He is, of course, a bachelor king. This is not something that Britain was used to. I think that in itself presented certain, let's say, imaging issues. I think that in terms of meeting the moment of the Second World War, he could have more than acquitted himself. Of course, during the 1920, late 1920s and early 30s, you know, he really comes into his own and that's because of the Great Depression. He it has an amazing ability to connect with the people he meets. He was really the first British royal to, you know, he went into people's homes, you know, he visited mines, he went down into them. Um, he, he was extremely, extremely charismatic and had the ability, I think, to present the empathetic and sort of direct touch, which of course is exactly now what we, we sort of demand of royalty in the contemporary setting. So I, I think he could have done very well visiting the East End, the bombed out East End, shoring up that kind of support. I mean, he had this track record as Prince of Wales, but it just would have, it would have been a very different vision of monarchy, a different vision of kingship than what Britain ultimately um, received. So that's interesting because as I'm sure you know, many people can say, can say, um, compare Diana to him as someone who is an outsider and an iconoclast. And even though he was born inside the family, he was so different from the rest of them that mm. the theory being that the establishment sort of united against them as modernizers. Do you think that's I mean, that's it? I think the establishment, I think he did become an estranged, an estranged from his class and his milieu. And then that's in part because he takes up this um, in, in a bit the way FDR does as well, you know, he takes up this kind of almost meritocratic mantle. You know, he sees, I think innately, he did not believe in the class structure. In fact, he writes at length in the book about how he he doesn't see why he's any different from anyone else. You know, he doesn't have any special qualities. And yet, as someone who is royal, he's constantly being told that he's he, you know, he's above everyone else. And he said, this just wasn't true. Um, and, and so he doesn't have that kind of of faith and hierarchy that I think is an absolute necessity if you're going to be a fully a fully paid up member of British royalty and aristocracy. And I think they sensed his I think they sensed his doubts about the structure overall. And, and it, it it did not make him friends. Um, well, you know, you mentioned um, his his sort of iconoclasm and his uh, desire not to sort of fall into the, the normal hierarchy. From what I read about World War One, so many men who went through the war lost faith in the decisions of the generals and the men that were supposedly smart that were running everything, and that it just changed their life forever. You mentioned very early on that he was formed as a young man by his experiences in World War One. I. I would guess that that actually formed who he was for the rest of his life because everybody that was somehow involved in the actual fighting of World War One was disillusioned by everything that they were told was right and good. And, and he writes about that, about the watching the sort of officer class basically completely be completely oblivious to the men who are, you know, being rained on in the trenches. At one point, he, he recalls an anecdote and he says, you know, he hears one of the sort of uh, the officers on the general staff say, oh, but don't they have their waterproof tarps? <laughs> and, and that and, and, you know past the port wine um and, and so he, he he sees that and he recognizes it and he sees i think what what is more important is he realizes the actual human consequences of this class hierarchy and that it it's it's completely unfair and i i think that does inform how he goes out into the world i think in a sense he can never take seriously his uh his uniqueness after that now that being said i mean he certainly lived a privileged elite life 
he was um in, enjoyed his wealth um so I, I don't want to say that it was you know he suddenly was kind of the sort of democratic you know pioneer um but I, I think fundamentally he he understood that there was a wider world um out there and he wanted to be a part of it in the fashion that he could so following on that do you see a parallel between the behavior of edward and prince harry i think that you know well i think there are parallels in the sense that they're ex they're they are they find themselves as british royals in exile um as, as murphy writes about the duke um finding his path in an extremely inhospitable world. And I think what Murphy means by that is that there's really no place for a British royal when they're not part of the British royal family, because of course their centrality and their importance is entirely predicated on membership in that institution. So what happens when you're no longer part of that institution? And Edward faces that battle for the rest of his life. I think Harry is also facing it, finding relevance when you're the thing that makes you relevance is no longer a part of your active biography. Wow, that's really well said. We have a number of comments, not surprisingly, about Edward and the Nazis. Um, so first of all, you and I have talked about this before, that he was not the enthusiastic Nazi supporter that we think of him as. But the other question would be, do we think that he would agree to be a puppet king of England if the Nazis had won the war? I think speculation is unhelpful. I think, <laughs> and I, think that's, I think that's one of the problems with with scholarship on the Windsors is that in the absence of information, speculation has run rife. Um, I think what's more important is to lean in on what he did do, which of course is exactly what he was told to do by the British government. Of course, there is this um, all important meeting in October of 1936. I mean, there are a few things I think to talk about uh, regarding this meeting. Firstly, that it was not part of the planned itinerary. They did not know they were going to meet with Hitler until about 24 hours prior and, and received notice and sort of winded their tour around uh, making this visit to the Barakov. Off. Um, he the, they they met for in total about of three hours, two of which the Duke and Hitler spoke alone with Hitler's translator, which which irritated the Duke because he was fluent in German. Um, he was irritated this translator was present, but the translator Paul Schmidt went on to write an account of the meeting, and he said no political conversation had taken place. Edward was in Germany to do what he thought was to restart a public career as a sort of roving international ambassador. He, you know, his cause as the Prince of Wales, which he had really bound up that office with, were an interest in primarily social housing and housing initiatives and also um, industrial conditions for workers. And he went to Germany as with the desire to see how the German economy had been revitalized under Hitler's um, uh, uh, under Hitler's direction. Now, again, a part something a part of the story that we also forget is that there was to be a second visit. He was meant to go to the United States and where he would have been welcomed at the White House for tea by Franklin Roosevelt and where he planned to tour Eleanor Roosevelt's um, model housing community in Greenbelt, Maryland. And I think it's so important to, to flag that visit, this, this visit that didn't happen because I think we would see these images of Germany very, very differently if we had these other images of the United States, if we had we had the image with Hitler, but we also had this image of him with Eleanor Roosevelt. I think that would give a new context to this visit to Germany. It was not a political intervention. And moreover, it was not an extremely unique thing to do. It was unique for a British royal, but in, in the sort of uh, a long list of British elite who did visit Germany, for example, Lloyd George, the, the prime minister during the First World War, had seen uh, Hitler at the Berghof in September 1936. And ostensibly, for exactly the same reasons that Edward had done so, which was to um, uh, inspect the German economy. Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM, who Edward met with in August 1937 while he was on his honeymoon, and while Watson was on his way back from meeting Hitler in Berlin, encouraged him to, to go ahead to try to mount this um, sort of ambassadorial style role and start in Germany and head next to the United States. So the visit, and that was really partly what that book that I didn't write was meant to be about, to give us the kind of perspective on this engagement with Germany in the 30s that we don't have. And, and fundamentally, of course, as well, predicated on the fact that 
Edward VIII was uh, aligned himself with the politics of appeasement. He did not believe there should be another world war, another military conflict on the scale of the First World War. And that was an opinion that was shared by his family. I mean, that was one of their few crossovers at this point in time, is that George VI uh, was a, a notable supporter of Chamberlain, appeared on the balcony after Chamberlain's return um, from his meeting with Hitler. This was So I think, again, it's, it's reframing in the context of the moment um uh these associations um so lots to unpack there i would say first of all in hindsight we now know that um, watson and ibm have blood on their hands for what they did to the with the germans to help using ibm machines to keep track of killing jews but besides that um i guess my larger question would be did um did he have any more admiration for Hitler than anyone else in the British royal family or the British aristocracy, who we know admired Hitler a lot? I mean, I've 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 never I, I don't think you can find I've never seen anything that he openly speaks of his admiration of Hitler. In fact, his driver or his detective who was in the car when Edward um, gets gets back into it after the meeting claims um, in his diary, at the, of which it was written at the time, he says that Edward got into the car and said, Winston is right, he can't be trusted. Um, so there's, Edward never went on record to say that he admired Hitler. He did go on record to say how much he admired Franklin Roosevelt. He admired the New Deal and that throughout the 30s, um, he's constantly saying things he shouldn't be saying, um, noting his admiration for all that the United States is doing to uh, revitalize the economy, to respond, of course, to the economic stagnation, which was uh, which was not what he saw was happening in Britain and which he very much um, felt frustrated by. So the question I would have then, why do we, and we all, I think, of a certain generation, see Edward as a Nazi appeaser? Why is it that and not the association with liberal progressivism, which he seemed to be naturally inclined toward in, with his friendship for um, with the Roosevelts and with the United States? Well, I mean, I think, well, firstly, there's, the, it's an, I was thinking about this if, as it as obviously it's a question that comes up all the time. Um, <laughs> one of the, right. One of the unfortunate elements about Edward is I think that image with, with Hitler is probably one of the few um, of him with a world leader in exile. That's, that's an, that's an unlucky pairing. Um, and so I think the power of that image, um, you know, there, there's no kind of competing, there's nothing competing for space there. Um, he, he didn't make it to the White House. He does meet with Roosevelt quite a few times during the war, and he goes to the White House several times for lunch. Um, but, but there's never this iconic image. I think, that I, I think from a very purely sort of just, I mean, this doesn't sound extremely intelligent or intellectual, but I think it's a sensationalist story that's backed up by images. And I think it sells its fate. And there's a, a lot, we, we'd have to have another lecture to talk about his time in Lisbon in 1940. Um, that that is it also sort of works into this idea that he was uh who was an alleged nazi sympathizer and, and that's very not incredible material that's not terribly credible credible it's not primary material um but it's a great story it's a sensationalist story this idea of a british prince who's a nazi sympathizer and, and I think it sells well. And, and Philip Ziegler, um, Edward's official biographer, really touches on this, that, you know, these narratives about Edward as a Nazi, they only surface after the Duchess's death, really, and really. That's when they gain, gain strength. It's after 1986. They have no heirs. There's no one who's going to battle for the laws of libel on their behalf. And that's when these narratives really take off, but built off of information that came into the public domain in the 1950s that Murphy knew about. Um, there's a wonderful letter I quote um, at, at the full length from from General Eith from President Eisenhower um, when the material of the the Windsor's time in Lisbon is about to be made public. Churchill write, uh, writes to Eisenhower and says, "You know, can't you stop this? It's going to be detrimental." And Eisenhower, write, Eisenhower writes back and he says, "I can't believe this material even exists anymore. I had John Winnett, who was ambassador American ambassador to Britain. I had him." look over this in 1945 it's completely ridiculous it just it's designed to paint the duke in the worst light it has no credibility i mean I, that's wow very that's really good to hear i'm so glad you're saying that and actually speaking of murphy um 
a great question that on a nicer subject yes. is did he and Edward have a relationship after the, the writing together was done? They did. In fact, they were in touch um, uh, pretty regularly until the Duke's death in 1972. Um, they they tried to get a couple projects off the ground. There's a talk of a biography of George III. The book they were really starting to work on together was a sort of compilation of Edward's letters as a young man um, and that Murphy was working on You know, when the Duke became quite ill in 1971. He had throat cancer and that project goes nowhere. And there's kind of, there's a very, really, very sad letter from Edward. We you know basically he says, I think we should just call it project abandon. Well, that's because he's, you know, in the grip of this, uh, of this last illness. And Murphy does not attend the funeral in, in, uh, in Windsor, but writes to the Duchess the day after a, a letter that is extremely poignant, um, you know, having watched the, the funeral on the television and remembering the time he spent going around these places because Edward, what they did was they did various research trips together. They would go to England and they would, you know, they'd go to, uh, they did go to the grounds of Fort Belvedere. I don't think they went inside, but they went to Windsor Castle. Um, they they just reconnoitered the landscape of Edward's youth together and, and Murphy's quite touching. And he sees the Duchess uh, occasionally in the 1970s, but she was becoming quite frail. But the, 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 that long-winded answer is to say that yes, he was in touch with them um, for the for the rest of the Duke's life, and uh, his daughter as well um, would see them in Paris um, occasionally. So it really was a bond that 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 persisted. Um, a number of people have asked if you see any evidence that um, the Duke's public reputation was orchestrated by the royal family, meaning associating him with Nazis helped them help the royal family. Um, I haven't seen anything that would pinpoint the royal family. From what I understand from sort of kind of quiet interventions, I do not believe they they do not subscribe to this view. Now, the Duchess certainly thought they were behind a general sort of discrediting of the Duke's uh, public persona uh, in the years after the abdication, meaning that that he wasn't an honorable individual. She believed that she, she says to Murphy at one point in the interviews, she called it a, you know, a uh, a propaganda campaign. But as far as I think the germ these German allegations, this is something that has been very much independent of, um, let's call it the establishment. It's really been promoted by and written about by um, journalists, and I, I'd say tabloid journalists, who have taken to history writing and, and really made this narrative fly. Wow. The last question is an interesting one. Um, is this the Lord Beaver book, Beaver Brook, whose home was open to the public and who was friends with Churchill? Yes, yes. And this becomes an extremely awkward part of the whole memoir process because when Edward sends the drafts to Beaver Brook, um, in part, it's because he'd like Churchill to read over them. He was staying with Beaver Brook in the south of France at Beaver Brook's home. And um, Churchill is sort of, let's put it this way, miffed because by this point, he has a very different recollection about what happened in 1936. The abdication is not considered one of Churchill's high moments because he very much put himself out in on Edward's cause and you know by 1949 he's rethought that and rethought where he wants to you know where his friendship uh lies which is with George VI and uh Beaverbrook hands the chapters to him and then has to tell Edward that he absolutely refuses to read them he writes to Edward and says he wishes to be above the narrative, to remain above the narrative. And it, later, Murphy writes to Edward's uh, editor at Putnam's, um, who kind of starts, who got, gets involved in this process, and and basically says that Churchill finally sat Edward down and you know gave him a telling off about you know why all the reasons he should not be doing this. So Edward is not a fan of, uh, Churchill is not a fan of this project. And there's even another in these wonderful Murphy diaries. Um, so. The Gathering Storm, which was Ed, uh, Churchill's memoir, which is written, uh, published in 1948, was serialized in life. And uh, there's a wonderful diary and Murphy um, observes Edward uh, reading A Gathering Storm and notes that Edward says he looks up from his pages and thinks, says of Churchill, he didn't think like that then. 
uh, because <laughs> in the gallery room, he's very complimentary of Baldwin and everything worked out for the best kind of thing. So it's it's a, it's what I think is so much fun about this book and about the material um, is that it gives all vantage points. It's not just Edward's perspective, it's Murphy's perspective, but it's Churchill's, it's Beaver Brooks. Um, we have all these people weighing in and commenting and observing um, this life. And someone who I've worked with on this book uh, considerably said, you know, it's really a story of perspectives. And I think that's right. I mean, it's 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 all of these perspectives that merge together and tell the story, not just of the memoir, but of who Edward was as a man. Um, the second part of that question, I'll answer. The house that um, Lord Beaverbrook had was called Churchley Court in Surrey, and it's not technically open to the public. It's a hotel, not surprisingly called the Beaverbrook Hotel, so you can go and stay there. Um, that is all the time we have today for our questions. If you have any other questions, you can contact us at any time at heritagetours at nehgs.org. Thank you again for joining us. If you leave, as you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and very much appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon again on our online programs. Goodbye for now.